Today, going back to the future. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And today I'm joined again by Tony Lecatro. Hello, Tony. G'day, Martin. Always a pleasure to be back and probably a bit of an upset result, even though I believe you, you possibly saw it coming. We're talking about the election, right? Because we're talking uh, Sunday evening after the election result. Yeah, I, I don't want to you know, claim too much credit, but I actually have said to a number of people that I was quite convinced that uh, it would be way, way closer than people were expecting. I felt that uh, Shorten was uh, actually not getting through to some of the people that we were surveying and uh, frankly um, yeah no surprise that uh, the other side of the coalition got back in yeah uh, I thought um, yeah I was on my way to a screaming jets concert to have a few drinks and drown my sorrows and I got I got the result and I, I actually cracked up when um, I heard sports bet paid out they paid 1.3 million dollars out then had to pay the coalition voters and an unfortunate punter put 850 grand on Labor, but he did it through Ladbrokes. So um, he lost a lot. So. Oh, oh, dear. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm actually quite intrigued that everyone was quoting the, you know, the, uh, the bookies with regard to the, you know, even on the ABC, you know, they were quoting the bookies. I'm thinking, well, I don't know whether they know quite what's going on, because my view is the surveys that I was seeing from my local stuff was quite different from what the polls were saying. So uh, there you go. It just shows that. And what's interesting is that there's quite a strong correlation between uh, some of the mortgage stress stuff and people who actually voted with the coalition. So, you know, up in Queensland, where mortgage stress is very high, a lot of the people there voted to, to, to support the coalition. So I think there's some interesting... I'll do some analysis later when all the results are in and see what, what I can read. But, uh, but it's yeah, interesting, it's of course, because the, the, you know, the AFR published a thing to say, said, well, of course, that means that we're going to see the property market now recover and bounce and everyone's going to be you know, back to where we were previously. I'm not so convinced, personally. No, Ed, no, I was having a look at Twitter last night and our, our friend on the other side, Stephen Kukulis, was providing live... <laughs> odds updates and suddenly I noticed they started to change behaviour and his behaviour started to change as well. And I think I read one tweet where he was saying there's still free money available at one point with the odds and as we know there's no such thing as free money. <laughs> that is true, Exa yeah. exactly right. But but you know what, what, what I think people need to remember is we've had prices drop you know in some cases 20-25% on the coalition's watch right. And actually, fundamentally, not much has changed post the election, right? OK, there's a little bit of promise, maybe, of first-time buyer incentives January next year. But other than that, I can't see what is going to change the atmospherics from this point forward. Well, I think if you look at the core logic figures, Sydney's still heading for a 1.3% fall this month. Yep. So the real estate market peaked in June 2017. So we're almost two years of declines now. And the way I see it is, I'm saying, I'm calling 45% peak to trough correction. And I'm sticking with that because people don't realize is Morgan Kelly, like yourself, has done a crap load of research on housing market bubbles. And he said, you lose 70% of your gains. Now I've got in a bit of a Twitter debate with Shane Oliver, <laughs> who uh, he's our Australia's best almost mainstream economist and he started quoting his figures and I said wait a minute Shane what you're saying is still we're going to lose 70% of your gains once you provide one or two more downgrades because he's downgrading 5% at a time and I think he's going to keep going so I don't know how economists the media has missed the fact that you have to give up 70% of your gains, especially when Sydney had that FOMO-driven, debt fueled speculative bubble. So pretty much we're heading for 35% off sale before we start marking prices down again. So I, I think ScoMo's win is relief, not optimism. Mm. Yeah, no, I think you're right. There will be a bit of relief because, of course, the the um, 
new changes that they were going to bring in would have actually tightened the investment lending even more. But there are very few investors at the moment in my surveys who are interested in buying into a falling market. Why would you? Right. Yeah. And we know that now more property investors are seeing the rental streams continuing to drop. Uh, and we know that about 60% of uh, property investors are now underwater from a cash flow perspective. There's no capital growth. It's going into reverse. So that's not no surprise to see property investors are still checking out. And that then says, well, OK, so there are a few first time buyers who may be sniffing around. But why would a first time buyer buy into a falling market? You know, if you wait till next year, you can buy cheaper, you can buy better. Um, and OK, you can now borrow up to 95 percent lvr you know from one january if you're one of, one of that ten thousand uh, uh um, you know transactors but actually two things you've still going to be assessed from a repayment perspective on 95 percent so your repayments are still going to be higher because of the title lending standards and secondly if you only have a five percent equity and prices drop just a little you're going to lose it all so you know it's not an ideal time for a first-time buyer to be persuaded to come into the market and so i think it's a bit irresponsible personally but you know that's just my well, own yeah maybe instead of ten thousand loans maybe just send a could offer us 10,000 Aussies to get a boat over to New Zealand. I think that would be better. <laughs> <laughs> well, it probably would be more more, more of a sensible strategy. So, I mean, the, the point I, I would make is that if you think of it in terms of the credit impulse, in other words, the rate of change of credit, that's still going down, despite what everyone's been saying. If you look at it carefully, it's still declining. The rate of decline might have eased a little, but not very much. We know that um, the auction clearance rates um, you know are wobbling around the 50 percent but the volumes are way 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 down on this time last year and the number of settlements are down 25 28 percent um, yep. time on markets continuing to rise still so we've got more properties you know sitting on there for longer um, there is no fundamental logic as to why we would see prices start to reverse and even if the reserve bank cut the cash rate, which is you know conceivable later in the year, one they haven't got very much wriggle room to take it down. But two, even if they did, I'm not convinced that all of that would get passed on in any case. I think the banks would more likely hold it back and then try and use those lower rates to attract the small amount of new business that's around. So, whatever way you look at it, I just can't see how this is going to fundamentally turn the market around. Yeah, my, my argument is that we're, we're going back to either the mid-70s or the mid-90s. And I think yep. people, you can set the DeLorean, whether you like the mid-90s grunge era, go back there, mid-70s. Because just after I was born, uh, Dad was able to buy a nice unit in Manly Vale for four times his income. And then when I uh, graduated from police academy, I was stationed in Waverley, then Bondi, and I was able to go and buy a unit in Bondi, 400 metres, give or take, from the north side, for 2.4 times my income. Admittedly, my mortgage was about 10%. But I just think this Insta-driven, debt fueled society, uh, you've got people checking their phones 150 times a day on average. <laughs> you've got online dating where everyone's disposable. You know, swipe left, swipe right, swipe or no swiping. Uh, for property investors, it's going to be flipper no flipping. So I remember growing up in the 70s, uh, dad worked, mum didn't have to work, we'd spend all day out. Uh, we lived in a modest house in Terry Hills. I look at prices in Terry Hills and you're paying $1.5 million just to get in the suburb pretty much. So the way I see it, Martin, is reversion to the mean over a long period of time is human's tolerance to handle paying debt and a high proportion of their income on houses. And this isn't a new paradigm. Uh, we're not in a period of permanently high prices, permanently low interest rates. We are on this slow grind back to affordability. And as I said in another interview, with labour, it's the economic equivalent of being sandpapered to death. And I still think even though ScoMo's in, there's just no fuel, there's no FOMO to drive our property market higher. And to me, once debt relative to income is, what, 190%? Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's that's unsustainable. I know Steve Keane put out some charts. What's our debt relative to GDP? 120%. Uh, the Swiss have higher debt, but they seem to be able to handle it. So I just think that um, we've reached 
the point of no return and the country, for a better word, is pretty much rooted. <laughs> it's a highly technical term, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 po the point there is that um, we know that, uh, you know, Switzerland is in a unique position because of the inflows and outflows. So in a way, Switzerland isn't abnormal. Amongst the typical uh, economies, we are way off the scale in terms of jet debt to GDP. Hi, excuse the interruption, but if you are getting value from this post, please consider subscribing to DFA if you haven't already done so, or ring that bell for custom alerts. Plus, please consider supporting our efforts. You can make a one-off donation via PayPal, here's the link, or subscribe via Patreon for as little as $3 US a month or more to get access to exclusive additional content. The links are in the comments below. And thanks for supporting what we do, it's really appreciated and makes it possible for us to continue to make more great content. Um, and the, the, the point, of course, that some people were arguing is, well, you only need to look at it from a repayment perspective, right? Because interest rates are so low, therefore people can actually afford to pay more back. But actually, if you look carefully at the latest RBA statistics, even there, the ratio of um, repayments to income is going in the wrong direction. So in fact, that's going, going the wrong way. Um, that's partly because the loans are bigger and that's partly because mortgage interest rates went up a little bit last year. So whichever way you look at it, all of the indicators are actually pointing the wrong way, which means that we need to have a reset. And I've talked a little bit about the alt control delete. You know, we need to reset. This has to be reset one way or the other. And then it's only a question of how quickly is it going to be a slow grind down over 10 years or is it going to be a more um, precipitous fall, you know, we're going to have to get back to more reasonable levels. And that's, by the way, how you solve housing affordability. So oh, yeah. expensive, <laughs> right. houses, yeah. expensive houses to start with, and then you just wait. Yeah. But what, what, I've, what I've noticed is that if we go into a deep recession, just say we really cop it economically, mm. it cleanses the system, then within a few years we recover, and guess what? Rates are going to have to start to normalise. Yep. And your viewers are probably aware that the, the long-term RBA cash rate is 6.5%, add another 2.5% for your mortgage, and that's the average. You're paying 9% on an $800,000 loan. That's only interest. Yep. So, And people say, well, Tony, interest rates aren't going anywhere. Well, when you're in a low-price environment, it's hard to change. And when mm. you're in a high-price environment, it's the same story. So yep. we can... I think for many people, they'd rather be gently sandpapered to death <laughs> rather than have the collapse and then have a 9% mortgage um, after it, it all recovers. So there, there's, nowhere to, there's nowhere to go, Martin, at all. I think we're going back to either the mid-70s or the mid-90s, an era of affordability where a nurse, emergency services worker or a teacher could afford to live near work, not live 60 kilometres in a dump in the outer western suburbs of Sydney and still have an $800,000 mortgage. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And interestingly, the 7.25%, which is effectively the rate, you know, that borrowers are assessed on, right, rather than the current mortgage interest rate, that's why 7.25% there. That is, as you say, the midpoint over the average, over the long term. It's an average, right? That's why that number's there. So anybody who's arguing that that 7.25% should be dropped, and there are quite, quite a few people who are arguing that it should be down you know, below 6%, um, are not actually understanding the long-term dynamics of interest rates, right? We are in a low part of the cycle at the moment, but there's no guarantee that it's going to stay low. And therefore, if we keep the um, lending standards too loose, um, they were way too loose. They're still too loose, in my view. All you do is just you bring more people into the risk area so that when rates do move up, they just uh, you know hit over the head even further. So my own view is there's no justification at all for advocating any fall in that 7.25% hurdle. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And uh, uh, people say, well, what about some other property markets? I think that Perth, Adelaide and Brisbane are going to get caught in that downdraft and possibly another 10 to 15 percent off here in Perth because I know the market's really struggling. Yep. We've got your mortgage stress figures was, would indicate that. We've got a huge level of bankruptcies in the, the fringe suburbs and it's just our market is, is dead. Yep. Well, you know, I published some research showing the, 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 the sort of the blacklist score, I called it. Basically, 
you know, if you compare some of the suburbs in and around Perth with, uh, you know, places over in Sydney, right, it's about three times as difficult now to get a loan over in the West, right? Yeah. And in that, and that urban ring around the centre of Perth, so a little bit out from Cottesloe and places like that, but a little bit further out, it is just almost impossible. They're looking for a 70% loan-to-value ratio, um, you know, uh, a lot of other uh, hurdles too. It is really, really, really tough to actually get a mortgage over in the West now. And we've got 3% defaults over in the West, right, which is twice or three times in the other states. But the worrying thing is that a lot of those defaults are from loans that were made in 2014 and 2015. So it's yeah. taken four years for them to go bad, right? Now, yeah. run four years forward in New South Wales and Victoria, and you could easily see similar quantums of defaults, which is why this market is not going to correct anytime soon. Well, it can't. Not, not if you, you go out to the likes of Jordan Springs, Rope Crossing, and anyone that's bought there post-2015, some of those houses, I think people are down two to $300,000 on a house, and there's only so much people can service these loans. Why would you hang on for grim death? Uh, your best option is to start looking at bankruptcy. And I, I think everyone, a lot of the mainstream, are underestimating that there's streets drowning in negative equity. Yeah, no, you're right. Well, the negative equity is a, is, a, is a big issue. And, of course, it's a big issue for borrowers because effectively they suddenly find that their mortgage is worth more than the property, which means they can't move, they can't refinance, they can't get the cheaper rates and those sorts of yeah. things. And, and that also means they're going to spend less at the shops and perhaps even try and pay down the loan faster. But the other side of the negative equity, of course, is that the banks themselves are under-representing the loan to value ratios that are currently in train because they're still using um, averages across you know states or across the nationally right and, and of course if they actually were to mark to market on the real true values they'd have to put a whole lot more capital against those mortgages so the banks who by the way over the last three or four years used to keep resetting the the, the, the LVRs um, to give themselves more capital when prices were going up suddenly aren't doing it now so there's a really big question here about negative equity, not only from lenders, uh, sorry, from the borrower's perspective, but also from the lender's perspective. And I think that's one of the big sleepers that we've got, that we've got effectively a set of capital um, uh, dynamics going on that are not just being adequately reported and reflected in the internal models that all the major banks are using. Um, and I think it's quite significant that um, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand on Friday actually uh, basically told off ANZ New Zealand and said you cannot use your internal um, processes anymore because they're not up to scratch. So they've basically yeah. lifted the capital in for the ANZ in New Zealand. And ANZ, by the way, by many analysts, is regarded as one of the better um, uh, you know, managers of, of its ratios and things. So for me, <laughs> this is yeah. this is the you know the tip of the iceberg. So the question is, how much more is there below the waterline in terms of what's really going on with these changes in values and how it's translating into negative equity and those things? Yeah, I was I was uh, had a private message for someone on Twitter, and he was saying that on one bank's HEM model, uh, VHS tapes were still in it. <laughs> Right. And, so, and I think, he, okay, wait a sec, that, that needs to change. I mean, <laughs> yes, like, not sure there are many people using uh, tape machines these days, right? So it just shows, it just shows. and you know, it, we know that the HEM um, is, is under the microscope now. We know that the court case between um, ASIC and uh, Westpac is, you know, has been heard. Westpac arguing that HEM is fine and, you know, it can be used as part of responsible lending. ASIC saying it's not appropriate to use HEM as part of responsible lending. Be interesting to see where the judge comes out on that. But, of course, ASIC's already said if they lose the case, then they'll actually um, change the law in any case. So, you know, I don't think that um, the HEM thing is going to actually necessarily lead to much lower lending standards. The only thing it might do is it might put a stop to historic class actions if, in fact, Westpac was found to be uh, within the meaning of responsible lending when it uses HEM. Yeah. Have you have you had a look at uh, what's come out of Vancouver, the amount of money laundering and fraud? Yes. So, I mean, I, I think that impact would be less on Sydney, but it's just absolutely crazy how Sydney got to 
times price to income when the when the historical average let's face it's three let's be generous let's give it a five or six i mean what the hell was australia thinking yep. and canada due to sydney falling is now the second most expensive real estate on earth and they're looking at registers of owners as well so um, yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, Australia doesn't rank very highly in terms of its um, uh, processes with regard to, you know, money checking and uh, ensuring that money laundering doesn't happen. And certainly a number of people I've spoken to in the industry um, believe that there is quite a high proportion of fraud and money laundering activity in and through the property sector, linking often um, real estate agents to lawyers to borrowers so it's actually structured you know in other words it's organized crime rather than just ad hoc um but it's very hard to get good data on that and uh, i suspect we will never know but the hypothesis is that um if it happens over there in canada it's probably happening here too i think we're, we're closer to canadians and i, I saw uh, some tweets today talking for quigs that uh, australia wants to get rid of queensland i mean good, good good luck with that but there was a scene there was a scene the big short where um uh mark Barr. He borrowed, oh no, Dr. Mike Burry. He actually borrowed the cargo shorts and T-shirts of the real Dr. Mark Barr. And he was saying in the 1930s, the rates of complexity and fraud went through the roof. US housing prices crashed 80% across the board and there were clear markers. And to me, uh, the clear markers are, are come to the fore in Vancouver. It's just a case of how much of that fraud has hit Sydney. Mm. And regardless of the levels of fraud, the bad lending, lax, whatever, Sydney's got to drop 35% from the top, and it will, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sticking to my 45%. Mm. I mean, there was a report today from Goldman Sachs saying that this is going to provide a positive price shock. Um, mm. No. Mm. Well, I, I, I certainly can't see that either. And, of course, last August... You know, I was quoted on 60 Minutes saying 40% drop from, you know, is, is what we're looking at. <laughs> I haven't changed my view. I still think that's, yeah, yeah. that's pretty much um, pretty much spot on. So, um, look, I think the message from today then, Tony, as we come to the end of this conversation, is yeah. that uh, post the election, little has changed. Um, you know, a little uncertainty may have evaporated simply because of uh, the fact that the coalition's back. But the fundamental downdrafts that we're both seeing suggests that prices will continue to fall and quite swiftly and therefore anybody thinking of transacting in the property market at the moment need to be, needs to be really really careful and particularly buying in in a falling market is always fraught with difficulty yeah okay well we're going back we're going back to the future martin and um let's hope it's it's a pleasure yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll polish up my delorean <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thanks tony talk to you again soon pleasure Bye. cheers so there you have it, a very interesting perspective from Tony there with regard to the way the property market is going to play out. And both he and I agree that the downside risk is very much present. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you again next time.